medical rights self plan for America. I have the um, great honor to um, listen to a talk on the book last night at the public library. And uh, you know, one of the things that really struck me in reading this book is the plan that the uh, person that she chronicled in this book had to save capitalism from democracy. That was one of his goals in his professional career. And last night, um, Nancy made the um, observation that democracy is not something we just inherit, it's something that has to be fought for. And I really enjoyed the talk last night, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy what she has to share with us tonight. And so please welcome Dr. Nancy McClain. Good evening, Brother and sisters. I am really happy to be with you, very honored to be here, in fact. In Wisconsin, you inspired us all when you encountered the first wave of what I'm here to talk to you about tonight, and you fought so courageously and alerted us all to what was coming, and that battle is far from won. My favorite explanation of uh, my book, uh, favorite description of it, comes from a friend who is a Civil War buff, and he started calling me uh, uh, Corporal Barton Mitchell. Barton Mitchell was an Indiana corporal in the Union Army uh, during the Civil War. And in 1862, as things were getting very bad, very dark, the Confederate Army was going from victory to victory and its fight to extinguish government of, by, and for the people and maintain a system based on slavery. As that army was winning, it was 40 miles outside Washington, D.C., 40 miles outside the Union capital, in this fight to subdue democratic government, and Robert E. Lee's forces left the camp a little bit too quickly. They left a battle plan behind, and that battle plan was found by this Corporal Barton Mitchell, who brought it to his officers, and they were able to rout Lee's forces in this battle that he had expected to win to keep his momentum going. Uh, and that battle didn't settle the Civil War. There were years left to go and, and lots of losses on all sides, but it did stop the momentum of the Confederacy. Uh, and uh, having that battle plan ultimately contributed to the Union Army's victory. And so I wear that name with pride. It's my absolute favorite comment on this book, and I really hope that uh, the person who said it is right. Because what the proxy army of Charles Koch left behind in an untended old campus office in uh, Fairfax, Virginia, is the equivalent of their step-by-step -step battle plan to transform our country into a place none of us would recognize and none of us would want to live in, and to do so by stealth in increments, play by play by play, without alerting the people to their true end game or even being honest about the moves that aim to get us there. Why? Because they know if they tell the truth about what they really seek and what the policies they seek will result in, people will re revolt. They, they're doing the plan that I describe in this book because they know they're a permanent minority and they want to go around the majority. To get a taste of what is coming nationally, think about what you have experienced in Wisconsin under Scott Walker. I know what I have experienced living in North Carolina under our Tea Party uh, Republicans. Texas is another good example. But you have to remember that that's only the faintest outline of the future that these men plan. This Koch-funded cause is out to secure not just radical policy changes in the 30 states they now control, as you are all too uh, well aware, but they are using the control over those states and a national Republican Party that they've turned into a delivery vehicle for the most radical right agenda America has ever seen, using the threat of primary challenges uh, and, and uh, funding as a carrot to move politicians, elected Republican officials, into obeying these extreme right-wing donors rather than even Republican voters. Uh, they are uh, using that control to push for a constitutional convention to rewrite our nation's founding document in a manner that would crush organized labor, that would privatize Social Security and Medicare and public education, that would prevent the kinds of regulations built up on corporate power by citizen action since the early 20th century, and much more. 
and they actually now have 27 of the 34 states needed to call such a convention. They had 28, but Common Cause got one back uh, in New Mexico. Uh, so I hope I have your attention now because this is really, really serious stuff. Um, and what I'm here to tell you is that behind all the seeming chaos and dysfunction in our public life today, there is a strategy underway from these radical right billionaire and multimillionaire donors, uh, a calculated strategy in play. And that strategy is pretty far along. The head of Coke Industries government and public affairs operation, a man named Mark Holden, gloated to an invitation-only audience of billionaire and multimillionaire donors in late 2015. He said, and I quote, we're close to winning. They, meaning the critics and the rest of us, don't have the real plan. So what is the real plan? I found that plan in the private papers of a Nobel Prize winning economist whose ideas made Charles Koch's money finally effective after 30 years of Koch funding all kinds of libertarian thinkers in hopes of, of breaking through. And I lay out this strategy uh, in the book. It is essentially a slow motion revolution to insulate capitalism from democracy, from the people, permanently. The core of that strategy that was first conceived in Charlottesville, Virginia, ironically, lately, so much in the news for the tragic and ugly events that occurred there. The core of that strategy, which was first put together in Charlottesville, Virginia, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, is to change not who rules, but the rules. Uh, the thinker that I stumbled on, a man named James McGill Buchanan, who won the Nobel Prize in 1986 in economics, he taught the corporate right and the libertarian cause that if they wanted to see the kind of radical and unpopular transformation that they did, they had to focus laser-like on changing the rules of governance. Uh, and in 1997, Charles Koch invested the first $10 million uh, at George Mason University, a public university just across the Potomac from Washington, D.C. He invested the first $10 million. He's now their biggest donor with a, with a, with a big outpost there. And he, this is what he said to the people that he was charging with carrying out this plan. He said, I want to unleash the kind of force that propelled Columbus to his discovery. So this is no modest man. This is no humble man. He's actually compared himself to Martin Luther uh, elsewhere. But basically, in this strategy, they are actually coming for all of us. All of us who rely on the 20th century model of government built up by citizen power, by labor unions, by organized retirees, by civil rights activists, by people in the women's movement, by people trying to protect our air and water quality. That's how much is at stake. And I have watched the state version of this unfold in my own uh, state of North Carolina, which was once the most moderate of the South. They have pushed through radical changes on this model one after another. They'll be familiar to you here in Wisconsin, I think. Extreme gerrymandering to misrepresent the will of the voters. Uh, new measures to undermine workers' right to organize in unions, particularly public sector unions and particularly teachers' unions attacks on public education at all levels and radical cuts in funding for it while um, uh, shoving off government re revenues to private uh, education providers who one shock judge said are under no legal obligation to teach students anything. Uh, they repealed the Racial Justice Act that had been hard won by people who were trying to make sure that citizens' constitutional rights were protected in policing and in the courts. They refused to accept the Medicaid expansion of the Affordable Care Act, despite a crying need for health care among people who would uh, earn too much to be eligible for Medicare, uh, Medicaid, rather, and too little to be able to buy their own insurance. Uh, they rolled back measures to protect the environment and reduce global warming. And then to cap it off, they passed something that has come to be known as the Monster Voter Suppression Act that had about 15 different ways of making sure that people who don't support this agenda are not able to participate in the political process. And again, that is just to capture the state uh, to use control over the majority of states <coughs> in rule book, the Constitution. So if we have this battle plan, what are the action implications for 
people like us in this room. I think there are three. One of them is knowledge is power. This Koch-funded libertarian right is using a stealth strategy because, again, they know that if the majority were aware of the real end game, people would try to stop it. As people just stopped those three horrible uh, bills that people were the, the um, uh, Senate Republicans were trying to to rush through. Uh, and I think that's a huge source of potential strength to know that this cause is afraid of the majority. So that the single most important thing that we can do, I believe, is to patiently inform and activate that latent majority uh, who, who would be shocked and horrified to, to live in the world that these uh, people are trying to bring into being. That will include much more systematic labor education and member discussions and outreach with com community allies, canvassing at election time and so forth. Second, I think another action implication is to see that the days of silo politics, as some people call them, are over. We cannot win this thing if we are in camps where there's, say, a women's movement camp here, and the environmentalists here, and the union folks there, and the civil rights people over there, and the retirees over there. Everyone is going to be affected by the changes that these folks are pushing through. Uh, and we need to reach out to people with that understanding. Um, we also need to realize that the architects of this effort are shrewd. They've been thinking hard about this strategy and this end game for decades now, and they have many thinkers on their payrolls who are helping them to come up with that. And that means they're going to do things like try to cut side deals with particular people to pull them out of the fight so that they can weaken somebody else, but they will come around for the people they cut side deals with. We saw this in North Carolina with uh, uh, two unions whose names I won't mention. Uh, uh, and they learned too late that that was just a temporary ploy to weaken the other side before they came around for everybody. Uh, so I have to say, you know, being in a blue state, and I was just talking to the Chicago Federation of Labor folks uh, earlier this week, being in a blue state or having a good contract in your particular workplace, that's not long-term protection. Long-term protection lies in that fundamental creed of the labor movement of solidarity and realizing that an injury to one is an injury to all. The last thing I think that's really important to start thinking about is that defense is not enough, right? That when you have a cause that's this strategic, that is planning to do something as audacious as what I've just described, and I'm sure you're thinking this is crazy, but I really am a serious historian. I've heard my world like this is really coming from a decade of really hard and deep research. When you have an opponent who thinks that strategically, it's really crucial to also think strategically, right? To stop, you know, we're all being caught up with Donald Trump and his tweets of yesterday or today, you know, and focusing on all this social media stuff that's coming at us. But I think what we really need to do if we want to stop this thing is to think long term. To say, where do we want to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now? And how do we get there? And who do we need to have on our side in order to get there? That's the kind of thinking uh, that we're going to need. Um, and I believe that the labor movement can do this. I believe the labor movement will in fact be the crucial spine of this effort to push back this, this bid to, to, to um, uh, really radically curtail our democracy. Um, but it's going to take a lot from everybody. And I think my, my core message is that this is an all hands on deck moment for our, for our, our democracy, the likes of which we haven't seen in our lifetimes. And I really, truly believe that what we are facing now over the next five to ten years is a battle for the soul of our country and the salvation of our democracy. And that has to be our starting point as we think about this and as we think about how to deal with it and how to go forward from there. Thank you. Remarks are uh, very refreshing to hear them down here. It seems to me that the biggest roadblock uh, in our movement is still racism. We still got people that still love Trump. I think that's because of racism. We still got people holding on to their dearly beloved guns. And it may have something to do with racism, maybe not. Uh, or just confusing about what the Second Amendment was really about. And then uh, thirdly, we got people that, you know, make snide remarks about Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. 
So, you know, I think we got a lot of internal work to do in terms of education our, educating ourselves about the harmful effects of racism and the, and the, and the big job we got to do to, you know, fight amongst our brothers and sisters to drive this um, a social disease out of our country. Thank you. I think that's a really important point, and I didn't get into it here in the interest of time, but this story actually begins in Virginia in the 1956 at the height of massive resistance to Brown versus Board of Education. The Virginia elite, which hated unions and had actually just passed legislation to require union organizers to pay a fee to come into Virginia communities while they talked about liberty, this same Virginia elite was going to, they, they shut down, they, they shut 13,000 white students out of their schooling for the whole fall of 1958 uh, in an act of preemption, something you know that's being revived now, um, in order to prevent <coughs> local communities from complying with the Supreme Court on the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Uh, and uh, for the rest of this story and for its deep background, there is simply no way to separate class and race. You know, in our country, the most profitable form of early capitalism was slavery. There were more, more wealthy people in Mississippi in 1860, I mean, more millionaires in Mississippi in 1860 than in New York City. So the people who came up with the most anti-democratic ideas in our country thought about property supremacy, as I call it, and white supremacy as being really linked together. And I think that we have to learn how to pull those apart if we are going to solve the problems that we are faced with now. So I appreciate, I appreciate your point. Isn't it true then that really slavery is their ultimate goal again? But not just enslave one people, but to enslave all of us. Isn't that really their goal? It's interesting that you say that because uh, until this guy, James McGill Buchanan, set to work, the most anti-democratic serious anti-democratic theorist in American history was a man named John C. Calhoun, the man who you may remember from high school history declared on the floor of the U.S. Senate that slavery is a positive good. It is better than free labor, was his case. Uh, but he also was concerned that national democratic majorities were developing that would oppose slavery and that would endanger it. And from that, he developed a states' rights theory of the Constitution in order to prevent that. And this guy Buchanan came as Calhoun's ideas were being uh, exhumed from the grave um, to fight Brown versus Board of Education. And Buchanan's own colleagues at George Mason have said that his system of political economy and John C. Calhoun's have the same purpose and effect. So, not slavery with chains, but slavery, I think you're right, as a metaphor to say a society in which none of us, their economic liberty, liberty would take away all of the freedoms that the rest of us value, including your freedom to organize at work, your freedom to speak up to your boss, you know, your freedom to, to run your life as you see fit, to marry who you see fit, and all of those things. So, uh, so I, I think you're, you're right about that. Carolinian, if she would recognize it, James Arthur Pope. <laughs> yes, Art Pope is the kind of Pope brothers um, uh, uh, fellow traveler and supporter in North Carolina. Um, he, yeah, he We've is, inherited him in Wisconsin. He is now the head of the Bradley Foundation. And the Bradley uh, Foundation has just donated $100,000 wow. along with the Charles Pope Foundation, $240,000 to a new economic Wisconsin University department out of Madison, suggesting, uh, shall we say, the things that they find interesting in economics. Yes. So uh, I was just wondering your reaction to us inheriting that uh, He's a scary guy and somebody you don't want <laughs> in your neighborhood. Uh, he, there's an article about him that you can find online called State for Sale. And he was crucial in using that, um, you know, when a lot of us didn't do all we should for the 2010 midterms. And then the radical right got control of redistricting and gerrymandered us so badly. After that, Art Pope was very much involved with that. He has uh, three organizations in North Carolina that he's funded from his personal wealth that are part of the state policy network. 
that is the you know the state umbrella group that pushes all this, and you guys have three of them also, I think, in uh, Wisconsin. In Wisconsin here, uh, so Pope is really really bad news. As are these Coke centers on campuses. There, you know, if you do have a chance to look at the book, you will see how destructive they are. That they are basically bringing this corporate agenda, right wing agenda, inside universities, almost you know in a parasitical way taking the authority of the university to move this right-wing agenda in Washington the state. So I show them that. Yeah. There are, though, there's always organizers out there, right? And there's an amazing group of young people who have started something called Uncoke My Campus. Um, and they are organizing on about a dozen campuses around the country, exposing the danger of these centers and fighting to restore transparency and academic integrity. And they've actually sued George Mason University administrators for uh, violating uh, Virginia's Freedom of Information Act in not providing donor agreements. Charles Koch is not the biggest donor to George Mason and has just made it an academic base camp for this project. So if you can put the kibosh on that thing in, in, uh, uh, at the UW, that would be great. I got my degree there, so I think it's kind of a personal of providing information about the code. Uh, what you can say, Laura, if you say this is the most frightening movement we've faced, how is it different than McCarthyism or, or worse in some sense? Uh, also, Trump doesn't seem to be the Koch's first choice. He didn't seem to be the Koch's first choice for president. How, how closely allied are they? And if you think unions are the key to the uh, not only defense, but an alternative strategy to defeat this, which, which union or group of unions or person in the unions that has been good on this, if you think has the uh, ability to carry us forward? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, we've definitely had right-wing movements before in American history. The first book I wrote was about the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s when it was at its peak power. So, you know, no question that there are various kinds of other right-wing movements, but what makes this movement so uh, frightening is precisely that we have let inequality in our society get to such a point that you have someone like Charles Koch, who's worth four to five billion dollars, for whom shelling out a couple, you know, um, 10 or 20 million on a new organization to push this agenda is really nothing. He sees it as a kind of, you know, just an investment opportunity. If it doesn't work out, so what? He's got more money, he'll go on. And he's recruited all these other donors to this, and it is now transnational. So they have a group called the Atlas Network that is working in more than 90 countries with something like 450 organizations pushing this agenda elsewhere, making significant headway in Latin America, uh, a recent article showed. Uh, so I think by its sheer uh, scope and audacity and also stealth, this movement strikes me as the most uh, the most dangerous. Uh, the second question was Trump. 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 Oh, so, you know, I don't know. I, we're going to see what happens about, um, it seemed like Trump was a surprise uh, to them and there are some things they don't agree on and yet one veteran Koch researcher, a journalist, uh, found that 70% of Trump's senior appointees came out of this Koch these Koch operations, these various Koch organizations. That includes some of his key people, like his Vice President Mike Pence, his Director of Legislative Affairs, Mark Short, the liaison to Congress, the uh, head of the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, um, Betsy DeVos. I mean, you can go on. There are so many people, uh, Steve Mnuchin at the Treasury, et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of people who are veterans of this. And while Trump is doing the con man thing, distracting us all, you know, getting us into little culture wars with his tweets, they're transforming the country, right? They are getting into more states, pushing more radical changes through. They are also uh, changing, radically changing, the Labor Department, the Department of Justice, the EPA. Uh, you know, again, I could go on. All of these federal agencies are being radically changed while we're all watching tweets. So my um, thing that I'm suggesting to people is First of all, do yourself a favor. <laughs> Lower your blood pressure, right? And don't pay attention to the tweet war or the culture war stuff. Just leave it for a week. And instead, pay attention to what's Americans for Prosperity up to? What are Freedom Chain Partners Chamber of Commerce? Which politicians are they leaning on? What's the Club for Growth doing? What's going on in these government agencies? And I really think if a lot of us stopped focusing on all the noise and spectacle for a week or two and redirected our attention to things that actually matter more to us and our future and our kids' future, I, I think that we go a long way. As far as leadership against all this? Uh, well, I think a lot of you, I mean, you guys showed amazing leadership, I think, in 2011. I think, again, I think it's really, I mean, who would imagine that somebody would have a project this audacious? 
you know, would have a kind of God complex to think that they can rejigger our world to make it suit them. So, so I don't, I don't want to fault anybody for where we are right now. But I think the crucial thing is, once we know about this, what do we do next? You know, who are we talking to? Who are we getting into conversations with? Who are we reaching out to? What are we saying? Where are we saying we can make a difference? You know, and it might be in your union. It might be, you know, talking to your workmates. It might be in your congregation. You know, it might be in writing letters. It, you know, it could be all kinds of things. But I think that we, it, it, again, I think it's an all hands on deck. Um, I was encouraged, I'm not a sports guy at all, uh, but I was encouraged by whatever it is that Trump would say in terms of what Kaepernick, whatever the other, as long as it was cultural, but when he hit labor, yeah. that's when the whole league, mm -hmm. you know, nobody stood up for Kaepernick before, no one, no, all of them, you know, all, nobody was standing for him, but when he said, you can't speak on your job. Yeah. That ignited everybody beyond whatever race they felt, whatever they even the donors of Trump. Mm -hmm. You know, went because that and I was encouraged by the fact that regardless of what people call the unions are down, that no, there's 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 a there's ember there. So I was encouraged by that. Thank you. And I think that's a great place to end because I felt the same way. I went to bed the night before with the news and I felt so depressed and then I woke up. You know, and then I saw the news the next day and you just saw this incredible solidarity. And it's like solidarity is alive. We have that ability. We have that capacity to stand with one another. And that's what we're going to be. One last thing. Uh -huh. If interested, how did it get your book? Um, they might, I, it, it, the bookstore was maybe going to come, but if not, it's at Boswell's locally. You know, I hate to say Amazon, because we all know about who's with Amazon. But it, it's in a lot of independent bookstores. It's in Target, or it was at Target for a while. So, so you should be able to find it, and it's called Democracy in Chain. And we, we would present you with... Oh, I love it.